Good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Bible study. Um, our scripture will come from Psalm 100, verse number 2. Psalm 100, verse number 2. And it says, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. That's coming from Psalm 100, verse number 2. So with that being said, we have come into this house for no other purpose but to praise and worship the Lord. We have come into this house to gather in His name to worship Him. We have come into this house to gather Father, for another opportunity to study your word. Now, Lord, we ask you to speak to us tonight from your word. We realize that you are good and you're God all by yourself. We ask you to bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good to see everybody out again tonight. Thank you so much for coming to participate in the Word of God. Amen. God is such an awesome and such an amazing God that He's given us another chance. Amen. Our scripture for tonight is Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. We're in chapter 4. Again tonight, we will finish up uh, picturize, picturize. There are four, there are five, rather there are five P's to effective evangelism. They are prepare, 
Be fair. Ten points. Ten point. Personalized. Personalized. Picturized. And prescribed. So tonight we are on Picturize one more time. We are on Picturize one more time. We are on Picturize. So we'll conclude on, on last week. We left off with the discussion portion of this chapter. So we will have that discussion tonight. As Brother Whitlock come and, and read uh, Matthew chapter 26 verses 36 through 46. That's kind of extensive so I want to read it. Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. Verse 36. Then J Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 40, Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, when we look at this text, we find Jesus. And one of the characteristics of Jesus is the fact that he prayed. He prayed regularly. He sets forth an example for us. And that is that we ought to pray regularly. We ought to pray often. We ought to pray continually. And as we pray continually, sometimes we pray in the midst of agony. How many of you prayed in the midst of agony? I mean, just flat out call on the Lord until you got flat worn out. Anybody? Anybody just have just, just got flat worn out because I've been asking out God and I'm still asking God and here I am again, God, asking you again. Jesus set forth that example in the garden of Gethsemane. This garden is the place of the olives. This garden is the place of the pressing of olives. This garden is the place where Jesus cried out to God. He cried out to him. Let's look at the questions and we, we open up for discussion. What is it like to be separated from God? What is it like to be separated? From God. Has anybody ever been separated from God? Yes, I have. Is anybody separated from God now? No. You've been so what is it like to be separated from God? What is it? There's a journey that starts. With me, it happened ten for ten years. I was with someone that was in the church and allowed me to do so. Um, and I really I was just laying out and I just felt like I wasn't coming. I know I was praying to get out of there, and God was listening, but I, when my day came, I prayed without ceasing. Move me. 
So the first part is when we're separated from God, there's agony, right? There's, there's pain, there's suffering, there's sorrow. That's the key word here. Jesus is in sorrow. Jesus is agonizing. Jesus is calling on God. And let me tell you, when it's, if there's ever a time that you need to call on God, it's in the midst of agony, pain, the, the defeat. I used to watch the sports when I was young, and when I watched sports, they would say, you either have the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. When we're in the midst of defeating situations, sometimes we are agonized. And guess what? It is human. When Jesus finds himself separated from God, he cannot enjoy the presence of God. When we are separated from God, we cannot enjoy the presence of God. When we find ourselves in situations where we just can't get out of it or we just can't get through it, we ought to pray. Whenever there's a separation, we ought to pray. For the first time, God the Father and Jesus the Son would be separated from each other. Jesus is in this garden. He's praying. And guess what Jesus did? He did the same thing we do. Take some friends with us. It's so powerful when you take friends with you that we'll pray. Was, was Jesus happy with his friends? Was Jesus in the midst of friends that were supportive of his prayer? Or was Jesus in the midst of friends that took advantage of the moment? Man, it's late at night. Man, it's early in the morning. Man, it's in the midday. I can't be praying with you. Are you with me? You have friends that'll pray with you in the morning, but they won't pray in the middle of the day. You have friends that'll pray with you at night, but they won't pray with you in the morning. You have friends that don't pray with you at all. Now, these are not some guys that didn't know who Jesus was. These are his cronies, his buddies, his dog, his friends, his family, his spiritual uh, people who looked up to him, who spent time with him, who knew he prayed on a regular basis. And here they are in the midst of Jesus' prayer, they're sleeping. What do you think about that? Is anything wrong with that? If Jesus is going to pray, why well, I got to stay up? Is anything wrong with them sleeping? He says, watch here while I go young and pray, right? What is he talking about? Watch here while I go young and pray. We know that Jesus' enemies are closely approaching. Jesus' enemies are close around. You watch and I'll pray. Could they watch? Obviously not. Been working hard all day. Sound like some church folk. Preacher, I've been working hard all day. I can't make it a Bible study. I'm too million online. Lady said to me, whenever you open the church back up, we're going to be in, in church. Baby, we've been, now this is October. I said, baby, we've been back in church since April. So that tells me not only was she not showing up, but she wasn't even watching online. So Jesus says, stay here and watch. So this is the moment where God is separated from Jesus. Jesus can't get any satisfaction. The human being, the spiritual man, is separated from God. Jesus is praying, God, will you remove this cup from me? I'm asking for a discussion, but it looks like I'm the only one discussing. So what is this cup? What is this that God... Jesus wished that God would remove. Yes, sir. It's the agony of going to the cross. One is the agony of going to the cross. Why Jesus don't want to go to the cross? Doesn't want to go to the cross. Why doesn't Jesus want to go to the cross? How many of y'all would volunteer to go to the cross? Anybody? 
Say, so, so what, brother? Yes, so he agonized over the cross. He agonized over death. Well, y'all been reading that and reading my notes. He's agonizing because people who he has been with still don't see him, still don't believe him, still don't trust him. And that's why we are winning souls by lifting Jesus. Because when we lift Jesus, he draws men unto, we ought to agonize when people are dying and going to hell. We ought to agonize. We ought to have problems with that. It's not just another dope dealer. It's not just another prostitute that's going to hell. There's a soul that's being lost, and we ought to agonize over that. So they separated. They're separated. God is saying, you got to go to the cross. Jesus is saying now, I really don't want to do this, but Jesus comes to the conclusion and say, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus was not agonizing over just dying for our sins. He's, he is dying for the sins of the world. He knew that he showed up to die for the sins. But Jesus got to go past the cross. He has to be flogged. He has to be beaten. He has to have skin pulled and flesh and blood pulled from his body. For something he didn't even do. He is carrying my sins and your sins. So what does it mean to be separated from God? God can't be in the presence of sin, right? So Jesus foresees his death on the cross. He foresees his carrying of mankind's sin. And as he's carrying mankind's sin, he's out of the presence of God. Wow. Any takers? What is it like to be separated from God? One sister says it's agonizing, says that many times when you're in the midst of sin, you can't get out. Anybody been in sin and couldn't get out? I mean, just, just can't get out. The Apostle Paul classifies the old man in our lives as, as a man that's riding our back. In Romans chapter 7, Paul says, every time I would to do good, sin is present with me. He paints a picture of the old way of killing off mankind. If you kill somebody, that's, that same dead man will be tied to your back. That dead man would be tied to your back until the, the bacteria in his body eat up the bacteria in your body until you toss it. Boy, it would be some saints on planet Earth if we still had that in place. Killing will be no more. So Paul says, every time I go to do what's right, this dead man is riding my back and he's reminding me of the sin I used to like. Our sin nature loves sin. We love it. I don't care if you've been saved for 50 years. Whenever your sin comes up, you love it still. Your sin nature loves it. Your sin nature appreciates it. But Paul says, I see another law in my members, in a different law in my mind, in my spirit. And it's warning these law, law, laws, these these laws are warring against each other. There's a fight going on. There's a war going on. There's a situation going on. It's not a wrestling match like WWE. It's all our fight. You know, you have your opinion on whether WWE is, is, is real or not. But this stuff is real. This is a real fight. This is a struggle. Somebody's struggling tonight. Lord, should I even be thinking this? Lord, would I, should I say this? Lord, should I feel this way? There's a war going on. So Jesus, Jesus is agonizing. He's dying for the sins of the, earth, of the world. Next question. What does Jesus mean when he pleads to God, the Father, to remove this bitter cup? How does Jesus' predicament in the Garden of Gethsemane compare to eternal separation from God? Is there a correlation at all? Is there any relationship? 
separation from God, agonizing by Jesus, remove this bitter cup from me, but Lord, if it's, if it's your will, I'll do it anyway. What is it in your life that you've come to the conclusion, I really don't want to do it way this, this way, God, but since you asked me to, I'll do it. You ever been to that point? Anybody? So she said she struggled to get in tonight. And you ain't the only one, sister. Let me tell you, a whole heap of people struggling to get in tonight. And a few made it. A few allowed the spirit to lead them. Others had all kinds of excuses. So there's a war going on within us. When we're separated from God, we can't get to God. God can't get to us. We can't feel his presence. We can't receive his blessings. Sin separate us from God and also separate us from our blessings. Sin does. And when you're separated from God, you ought to be like bouncing ping pong balls trying to get a way out. You ought to wrestle to get a way out. You ought to agonize to get back to God. Mind is strained. Heart is in trouble. I mean, our hearts leads us far away from God. When you see a person act a certain way or do a certain thing, it's not just in their actions, it's already occurred in their hearts. It's in their hearts. It's in their hearts. When we, we are winning souls, we must first of all emphasize the positive. Make sure you emphasize that which is positive. Last week we talked about the difference between heaven and hell. Heaven is a good place, heaven is a bad, hell is a bad place. The good place called heaven is where we all want to go. We can go if we confess Christ as our Savior, period. If we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are guaranteed to go to heaven. But the problem is, we think, some people think rather, that there's more to it than and because they think it's more to it than that, then they want to do it some other kind of way. They want to do it some other kind of way. There's no way to get to God, no way to get to heaven, but through Jesus. We must emphasize the positive. Paint a picture of what is positive. Paint a picture of what is godly. Paint a picture of heaven more than a picture of hell. We know people going to hell. We know hell was made for somebody. We know hell is real, but let us focus on heaven. Emphasize the positive. Keep your comments cheerful and productive. Keep your comments cheerful and productive. You make sure you emphasize things with cheer. Give people joy. Give them hope. Give them love. Be cheerful about it. Avoid aggressive confrontations. Avoid aggressive confrontations. Avoid what? Aggressive confrontation. Avoid it. Stay away from it. aggressive confrontation. Make sure you're cheerful and make sure you are productive. That ought to be your talk. That ought to be your conversation. That ought to be what you're all about. People see you, you ought to be cheerful. People come around you, you ought to be cheerful. And you ought to be productive. You ought just to be productive. You ought to be productive. Avoid aggressive confrontation. A quiet one-on-one -on -one conversation usually leads to success. Quiet, common, everyday conversation. I mean, so tonight I'm teaching, right? On Sunday, I, I, I preach, right? What is the difference? All y'all been in church all your life, probably. So what is the difference between teaching and preaching? Is there a difference? Yeah. Come on, give me that theological. Come on, brother, give it to me. I've been trying to get a dialogue all night. 
I'm trying to teach. <laughs> that brother says, when you are teaching, usually there's a dialogue between people and pews. A teacher and pew. Yes, sir. You were about to say something else. Okay, so uh, should there be dialogue on Sunday? No. Should be in dialogue on Sunday? You and God. Should be in dialogue on Sunday. So I come to preach Sunday and there's a dialogue between me and God. Where y'all come here? Why y'all sitting here? Is there a dialogue on Sunday? Just tell me. Yes? No? There, Is it? There can be. There can be? If you ask a question. If I ask a question. So what do you do with the words, amen? What do you do with the words, say that again? What do you do with the words when Sister Henry holler out something? That's still not a dialogue. That's a call and response. Oh, that's a call and response. That's different. <laughs> Sister Woods, you're saying something. I think that's not a dialogue. That's not a dialogue. So what's the difference? Y'all got Sister Sister Brown sitting here like, what are these people talking about? So what's the what's the difference in a dialogue in that takes place on Wednesday and a dialogue that takes place on Sunday? Or does a dialogue take place on Sunday? Not usually. Not usually. At the New Beginning Church, hey. Huh. Yes, sir. I, I, I could be wrong. It's been a long time since I thought about this kind of thing. But there's a form of teacher called didactic. Yes, sir. And that's what Christ did a lot of time with his disciples. He he spoke and they listened. Okay. Okay, so I guess that's how what you see mostly on Sunday. Okay. It's a didactic type. So we come in on Sunday so we can be fueled up for Monday and the rest of the week, right? We show back up in the middle of the week on Wednesday so we can be refueled to go back out and fight the devil some more, right? Because the fact of the matter is, we ought to have dialogue on in Bible study. There ought to be an exchange. We ought to have dialogue on, on Sunday morning, Sunday school. There ought to be an exchange. There ought to be some, some period where you are having conversation. One, one night, a guy came and visited us, and he, he wanted to ask a question. Every time I answer a question, he asks another question. Then I ask another question. He want to answer another question. And he, I said, wait a minute, brother. You and I are having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And that's what, that's not what Bible study is all about. When we witness, it ought to be a one-on-one -on -one or a group-on-one -on -one or a group-in-one conversation. It ought to be a quiet delivery. Let me tell you what I'm after. The difference on Sunday and Monday and Sunday and Wednesday is that teaching takes place to not only inspire and fuel up, but it's a dialogue where you also let the teacher know where you stand. So am I knowing where y'all stand tonight? Are we dialoguing tonight? Are we talking back and forth with each other tonight? Or am I monologuing? Do I use the monologue on Sunday and monologue on Wednesday too? Or am I pulling teeth with a tie, do, tie a string to the, to the tooth and slam the door? When we witness, we want to have a conversation. We don't want to have a confrontation. We want to have a conversation. And when we have a conversation, we need to understand that that conversation can be successful and it is better successful if we just have a reasonable conversation, not a confrontation. How many people want to get beat up every time they show up? How many people want to just get slapped every time you show up? Oh yeah, here we go again. You want a dialogue. Tell me where I'm headed. Tell me what I'm doing. Tell me what I'm doing right sometimes. Tell me what I'm doing wrong sometimes. Pastor Rose said to me, you don't want to get up and fuss at the people. Have a conversation with them. Have a conversation. It's not your preaching time. It's your teaching time. 
Co communicate clearly. Communicate clearly. When you're soul winning, when you, you're reaching souls for Christ, communicate clearly. Make sure there's a good understanding between two, the two persons. Make sure the patient clearly understands. Make sure. Now, like tonight, I'm trying to make sure you understand. How am I making sure you understand? How am I attempting to make sure you understand? I'm asking a question. Do I know if you understand? No. Why don't I know if you understand? Because you're not responding. Why aren't you responding? Because you're tired. Because you don't want to be here. And I'll be so glad when he sit down. But, but make sure, make sure you give God your best. Make sure you give God your best. You know how on, on Sunday morning when the teachers are teaching and, and they can tell you well and I can, you know, they're trying to get a response because they don't need to know where you are. And as they know where you are, then they can better explain the situation. Such it is with soul winning. Make sure the person understands. In other words, every now and then you got to check. Even though you may have to restate your message several times and in several ways, your message should be delivered consistently. You may have to restate yourself. You may have to go over and over again. You have to make sure people understand, like we do with children. You don't just want to get a child because they want to get wet and baptize them, do you? You want to get a child where he or she understands the word of God to the extent, to the point where that person understands it so well until they can recite it, they can tell you about it, they can make sure that you know that they understand. So we don't, we don't just baptize children nor adults just to be baptizing them. We want them to be able to recite the gospel story. We want them to be able to have faith in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection on Calvary, and what does that mean for them? Such it is when you win in souls. You want to make sure they have an understanding, and you want to be consistent even if you have to say it a different way over and over again and restate it and regurgitate it. You want to make sure that they understand. Make your message clear and meaningful to the patient. Make your message clear and meaningful. There are a lot of Greek words, a lot of Hebrew words that I've learned. But it means nothing if you don't understand it. If I stood here tonight and started speaking in tongues at 7.15 and stopped at 8.15. Did it do you any good? Anybody? If you speak in tongues? Yes. No, because uh, when you speak in tongues, I can tell you should be able to speak to someone that can interpret. Okay. So if I spent one hour or an hour and a half talking to you in an unknown language, have I said anything to you? If I stood here, yes, sir. I, I, I would say no, and I go back to uh, I think it's First Corinthians when uh, Paul was talking about uh, the uh, uh, setting up the church. Uh, he made the statement that if there's no one there to interpret, to speak in the tongue, uh, he didn't use the word. Uh, use the, the if if nobody's there to interpret it, then. Uh, it's not beneficial. Right. But there's a second way, uh, another form of speaking in tongue. If you are alone and speaking in tongue, and if it's between you and God, then that's beneficial. But if you're speaking in tongue and nobody is there to interpret it, I know what you're talking about, then it's not beneficial. Okay, so my message is no longer clear. So if I stood for an hour and, and, and spoke to God, you all are going to say, he shouldn't have had us come out here. He should have gotten along with God. And somebody said, yeah, that's a good, good reason for me not to come out here. I'm looking for a reason in it now. Make sure your message is clear and meaningful. It has to have meaning. It must be relevant. It must be clear. And it must be accurate. 
You may want to write that down. Whenever preaching is going on, whenever teaching is going on, it must be clear. It must be accurate. It must be relevant. It must be relevant to the times in which we live. And when messages are not relevant, someone has not gone, done their homework. Let's turn to, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. Who has a King James Bible? Anybody. Anybody with a King James. Not New King James, but King James. King James Bible. You got all kinds of gadgets now, so. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. Who's there? King James Bible. Stand if you would. So smile. First uh, Thessalonians 4 and 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Key word prevent. Now, thank you. Now, the Apostle Paul is talking about the rapture, the, the snatching away, the catching up of the church, the delivering the church from earth to glory. The Apostle Paul talking about People who died in Christ do not act a fool like those who have no hope. Do not sorrow like those who have no hope. He said to us, whatever you do, have hope. Whatever you know, do, know that there is hope. He says, do not sorrow as some who have no hope because those who have died in Christ, they shall rise first. When you get to verse 15, it says, we should not prevent those who have already died. If we don't do our homework, if we do not do our study, and I've heard it preached this way, the person will get up and say, we will not hinder them, we will not hold them back, we will not stop them who've already died. Now, first of all, you shouldn't be dealing with the dead anyway. Secondly, you have nothing to do with what time they rise. You have nothing to do with if they rise. So we know this word prevent in the old original Greek language is, doesn't mean the same thing it means now. So when you look at other versions of the Bible, many of them will tell you what this word prevent means. What the word prevent means? Precede. 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 So when you read that scripture again, when you read it from another version, it will say, and those of us who are alive and remain shall not precede those which are asleep. What does the word sleep mean here? <coughs> dead. So we will not precede those who are dead. We will not go before. Then he goes on to explain, for those who died in Christ shall rise first. Those of us who remain shall rise later. Verse 13 through 18 says that these things will take place. And when he gets to verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, encourage one another with these words. If we don't do our homework, we will preach a lie. If we don't do our homework, we will teach a lie. And guess what we lied on? We lie on God, because it's God's word, not our word, right? So we don't want to lie on God, do we? Elaborate on the word of God. Elaborate on the word of God. Talk about God's word. When you're witnessing, spend your time talking about God's word. Talk about who God is. Talk about what God has done. Talk about what God's word says. Talk about God's word. I was in Bible study last night, Pastor Rose teaching, and, and he was saying, thank God for the preacher who preached the minister's meeting today, which was Tuesday. He preached to a group of ministers, and he preached Jesus. And he said that as if preachers are not preaching Jesus. So he walks up to him and he said, brother, you preached Jesus. Was that a compliment or a put down? 
We have to teach, we have to witness, we have to preach Jesus. If we preach Jesus, if we teach Jesus, if we witness for Jesus, and we use Jesus as the center of attention and the main attraction, we won't have all these other conversations, these other fights, these other stuff that we get involved in. Just receive. Just teach Jesus. Just witness Jesus. After I preached my dad's funeral, my nephew came up and he said to me, Uncle Matt, you preach Jesus. He said, you preached Jesus. So you know what that tells me? That he's been to some funerals where the preacher didn't preach Jesus. But when we teach Jesus, we preach Jesus, we witness Jesus, then there's a clarity that's there that would not have been there. Speak passionately and sincerely. Be for real. Be passionate about it. Used car salesmen are passionate. People have said that certain people, the way they talk to people and communicate with people, they can sell ice to an Eskimo. Uh -huh. Why do they, they say Eskimo? Why, why do they say you can sell ice to an Eskimo? Because when you look at Eskimos, they live in an area where they don't need ice, right? But if you can be clear, be relevant, and be accurate, then and only then is your message hitting the spot and successful. So I said be relevant. When you're speaking relevantly, you're speaking about these times. Check this out. When I was a boy, Coke was something you drink. When I was a boy, crack was a line in the sidewalk. When I was a boy, ice was something you cool your drink with. When I was a boy, fruit was something you pulled off the vine. Now that I'm a grown man, all those things are drugs. When I was a boy, money was paper. Now money, moolah, is something else. What we have to understand, languages change. And as languages change, we have to study in order to keep up with the language. Coke was something we drink. Now when we say Coke, what we think of? Something you smell. Crystallized. Cocaine. What is crack? Drugs. I'm talking about a line in the sidewalk. When I was a boy, little people were called children. What are they called now? Kids. When I was a boy, a kid was a goat. I must be pretty antique, though. A kid was a what? A kid was a goat when I was a boy. So we have to make sure we bring things up to what is relevant, what is right now. You have to make, be clear. You have to be relevant, and you have to be accurate. You have to be clear, you have to be relevant, you have to be accurate. Trust God for a miraculous healing and salvation. Trust God. Trust God. Trust God. Employ, and we talk about soul winning, right? Relate the accurate and relevant truth. Employ examples to which the patient can relate. This whole book is written around medical terms. Because all of us in here can relate to medical terms. How many of you all ever been to the doctor one time? Anybody in here ever been to the doctor? You've been once or twice? If you're over 12, you've been there a whole heap of times. And some of us have even given blood, and some of us have even taken blood, where there are others in certain religions that don't want to receive blood. 
Let me tell you a secret. If, a, a secret. If I go to sleep and I need blood, I will receive blood. I want to let you know that. Put that on your heart. Put that on your mind now. I will receive it. Tell biblical stories that relate to the patient's situation. Biblical stories. Stay in the Bible. All examples, all demonstrations, and all illustrations should be biblically supported. Don't just tell a story just to be telling a story. Don't tell a story just to get a laugh. Tell the story because it's something that God has related in his word. Always minister truth. Always minister truth. And what is truth? God's word. Based on your message of truth, God's word, people will be delivered. Base your message on truth. Base your message on God's word. Based on your message, based on truth, people are delivered. Always present biblical stories and examples that are relevant to the patient's condition. Why talk about Daniel in the lion's den if the situation is not fit for Daniel in the lion's den? Why use what is known as an attention getter if it's going to pull the attention of the unsaved away from what you're talking about? Keep the patient, keep the unsaved focused on salvation, on deliverance. And the only way you can do that is talk about Jesus. Pray for guidance. Stay in constant communication with God through prayer. This is God's work, not your work. This is God's doing, not your doing. As Jesus is lifted, God draws men unto Jesus. If you lift up Jesus, God does the drawing. God alone reserves the right to conduct his work. Don't get in God's way. Follow God's lead during the operational procedure known as soul winning. Acceptance or rejection of Jesus Christ is a life or death situation. It's a matter of life and death. And you may want to emphasize this, man, this is a matter of life and death. This is not something you can take lightly. This is a matter of life and death. I need your attention now. This is a matter of life and death. This is not, a, not just a matter of life and death. It's a matter of your life and your death. Regardless of the past or the present, communicate hope and emphasize love. Communicate hope and exemplify love. Regardless of the past or present, there is hope in God still loves. Regardless of what a person has done, regardless of what a person is going through, it is your responsibility to emphasize love. Show that person love and exemplify hope. Show them love. Communicate love. Exemplify hope. <laughs> Dive into love. And you know what? People know when you love. You know, we do that fake church, church hug. People know it. They know when we're fake. They know when we're really loving them. We, they know when we really want to be around them. Yeah, people have not taken the decency of shower like you have. But if we were to look at your past, look at your heart, you look like them on the inside. When you didn't have Jesus, you looked terrible. Now the Holy Spirit restrains us and holds us in place. There are some people that have been waiting. I've been just waiting on him to say something to me. I'm going to tell him all I have to say. I've been waiting to tell him. Now he, it's, it's like when I was in elementary school. When I was in elementary school, Ricky Johnson, real light-skinned guy, Ricky Johnson was in high school. 
And Ricky Johnson wasn't a big guy, but he was bigger than us who were in elementary school. So there was a there was a sidewalk that led from the, the junior from the elementary school to the high school. Because the junior high was across town. And so the high school boy, Ricky Johnson, will come down the sidewalk, and as he came down the sidewalk, he would push little children off, push them off. Well, I was a big boy because I was in the seventh grade. Ricky Johnson was pushing guys off the sidewalk, and one day I said, I hope he pushed me off one day. And lo and behold, Ricky Johnson pushed me off the sidewalk that day. And I can only kick as high as I stand. And I ran back. And I let Ricky Johnson have. I ran way back. I had stayed up all night long and said, Lord, maybe it's tomorrow that Ricky going to try to push me. Ricky pushed me off that sidewalk that day, and when I got to high school, he was still there, and he still respected me. I said, when I got to high school, he was still in high school. While he was pushing little children off the sidewalk, he should have been getting his lesson. And so what we have to understand is that the Holy Spirit restrains us from staying up all night and making plans. I stayed up all night making, I mean to two, three in the morning. Now, talk to the Lord about it too. What am I going to do? I know he's bigger than I am. What am I going to do when he pushed me off the side? Well, I already said, I wish he was pushing me off. Ricky pushed me off that sidewalk and I ran way, way back. I ran way back. And I let him have it all. As high as I stood. All of them. From that day to this one, Ricky never pushed another boy off the sidewalk. We have to get to a point in our lives where well, the past is the past. Yes. And because I still have this sin nature, Brother Whitlock, every now and then I laugh about it. <laughs> every now and then I rejoice over it. <laughs> every now and then I like it. Got him. <laughs> and he never pushed anybody else off the sidewalk again. But now that I'm saved, I'm sanctified and I'm filled with this precious ooh, Holy Ghost. I have to make sure that I step off the sidewalk and let Ricky pass by. Like you do now. When people do you wrong, you, you, you smile and you bless them as Jesus says you ought to. The patient should be challenged to be a victorious present the patient should be challenged to a victorious present and a rewarding future. Aim at the patient's heart while exemplifying hope and love. Aim at his heart. God has created a heart in every man, an innermost being that God has blessed us to connect with him. Treat the patient like you want to be treated. The patient will know you are a Christian by what? Your love, the love you show toward him. Jesus says the world will know we are Christians by our love one to the other. The world will see that we are Christians by our love for the world. I remember one Sunday I said, I want to welcome to the New Beginning Church all the dope dealers, all the prostitutes, all the homosexuals, the lesbians, all the robbers and the thieves, and I got looks like, what did you say? What did you say? But we forget that we are used to be. We used to be something or the other. And because Yours was different, doesn't make you better. 
We all used to be something. Amen. When I was telling that story about Ricky Johnson, y'all was cringing. But you've done something also. You've been vindictive even in your Christian life. Some of you still trying to harness your attitude. The Bible says that a man who has no control over his own spirit is like a, a city whose walls are torn down. Most, most of the people in this room and most of the people that have ever been to New Beginning, you all really know when I'm really angry. I mean, you know when I've just had enough. and I, I mean, you know when some of you say, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. So who can tell me when I'm really, I mean, I'm really at that point? How can you tell? Do my lip quibble or something? How do you tell when I'm really, really at that point where it's over now? What's the mannerism? What's the face? Oh, really? Okay, anybody else? Brother Miles probably been knowing me more than any than anybody in here. Brother Miles, what, what's that what's that moment that you know? You just know. Don't get real quiet. You're real quiet. I think that's it. I mean just real. So it's brown is just get real quiet. Just as long as I'm talking, everything's good. Everything's safe. Everything's good. But just as I can get to that point, you can get to that point. And just as I am trying to allow the Holy Spirit to harness mine, you need to make sure that the Holy Spirit harness yours. In soul winning experiences, you need to understand that you will get to the point where you are about to lose it. Doors slap in your face. People say bad things to you. And you just have to keep on smiling. Keep on ministering Jesus. Keep on talking Jesus. And as you talk Jesus, lives are changed. Hope is renewed. Love goes forth. But you can only do it through talking Jesus. Your testimony is good, but it's not your testimony that saved people. It's Jesus' testimony that saved. So you want to give the patient, the unsaved, hope and love. Look at their hearts. Treat the person like you want to be treated. The patient will know that you are a Christian by the love you show toward him or her. Regardless of the patient's history, let him know that there is hope for healing. From sin. In Jesus Christ. Once saved. He will never be separated. From the love of Jesus. Jesus says. In Matthew, Jesus says in John 10. He says. They are in my hand. And no one. Can snatch them. Out of my hand. When you are saved, when you are born again, Jesus is so much God, he has us in his hand. And the devil in hell, not even death, when you look at Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans chapter 5 and 8 says, while we were yet in our sin, Christ died for us. Jesus died for us. God demonstrated his love toward us and that he gave his son. Jesus died a voluntary death for you. If there was no one on planet earth but you, he would have died just for you. And Jesus died one time for all. John 3, 16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So just as, as Moses held up the snake and the people looked up at the snake and they were healed. As Jesus has been lifted up, we look to Jesus and we are healed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Not that he loved us so much that we can't go under him. Not that he loved us so much we can't go over him. Not that he loved us so much we can't go around him. 
that so like, just like Moses held up the snake, Jesus the Christ is to be lifted. John chapter 12, verse 32 says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Just as Moses lifted up the snake, just as we lift up Jesus, God draws man. We can't make him come to Christ. The Holy Spirit draws one to Christ. Appeal to, we just talked about appealing to his mind and his heart by love and hope. And finally tonight we'll talk about appeal, appealing to the patient ears in his eyes. Appeal to the patient's vision through his eyes. Help the patient see what you mean. Most people learn best through visual aids. Help them see it. Utilize visual aids. Utilize tracks. Utilize videos. Utilize Bible verses. Utilize maps. Utilize demonstrations that are in correlation with what you're talking about. Appeal to the patient's senses of hearing. Actively listen. Actively listen and rephrase your message as needed to ensure that the patient understands clearly. Use whatever you have. Use what God has given you. Listen to the unction of the Holy Spirit. And let me just tell you, every time God speaks to people, he's not calling them to preach. Every time somebody tells you, oh, I was drinking all night and my bed started spinning and, and God called me to preach, God just called you to get right with him. God is calling us to do it his way. Whenever God speaks to us, he's not always calling us to preach. He's calling us to righteousness, to holiness, to godliness. He's calling us to Jesus. Because Jesus is our only helper. The Holy Spirit is our paraclete that helps us since Jesus left. Jesus is the one who saves us. Jesus is our helper. He's the one who, who, who keeps us on the right track. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Oh man, I was up all night reading my Bible and I know God is calling me to preach. God calling you to holiness, to righteousness. That's why in Acts chapter 1 and 8 he says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. The Holy Spirit helps us in our witnessing. Because guess what? You can preach without the Holy Spirit. You can speak in other tongues without the Holy Spirit. You can teach without the Holy Spirit. But Acts says you need the Holy Spirit to witness. You can shout without the Holy Spirit. I've seen people shout out the church. I've seen people sing, and after they got through singing, they went in the back. We said, we, they said, we show sure the flay them in there. You think that was the Holy Spirit? That's one reason I don't go to musicals now. Because I was a young man and I saw them bragging about how they made people shout. So now I go because I have to go. But it's the Holy Spirit, He. It's the Holy Spirit, He, that leads us, guides us, protects us, and, and directs us. There may be somebody here tonight who never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. The door of church is open. The invitation is extended. You need to get to know Jesus. Trust him tonight. Trust Jesus. According to 
Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, according to John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8 and 9. You need Jesus to be saved. You need to believe the story. That over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for our sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And he rose from the dead. Will you bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life tonight? Just repeat after me this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus... I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that you honestly prayed this prayer, trusting in the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We believe that you're born again, and you're in the hand of Christ, and you're on your way to heaven when you die. We only thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. He has blessed us one more again to show up at the house of prayer and to hear the word of God, amen. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give by way of electronic means, you can give by way of, of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. You can give both your gifts, your tithes, your offering, as well as your sacrificial gift. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can give by mail. Our P.O. Box is 503 Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you for your word. We ask you to bless us now. Bless our church as we move forward in your name. And bless us, Father God, that we will always be about your work of winning souls for Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Uh, those of you who have ordered the book, Sharing the Gospel, Good News on the Go, those of you who have ordered the book, your book is in. If you have not paid for it, you should pay for it. If you have not ordered it, you should order it. I'm going to ask, I'm going to lower the bar a little, a little lower than what I've had. I'm going to ask you to purchase one book for yourself. Purchase two for someone else as, as gifts and help us move these books. It's called Sharing the Gospel, Good News on the Go. Those of you online, please inbox me and let me know if you want to have Sharing the Gospel, Good News on the Go. It's a good training tool. Over 20, well, 20 authors are in here and they address soul winning from their very own professional experience. Amen and thank God. Let us stand to be dismissed. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for the opportunity to share Christ with men, women, boys, and girls. We ask you to bless us, Father God, as we continue to walk this walk and do the things that you've called us to do. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, "In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. God bless you. John chapter 12, verse 32. You are dismissed.